I think we're okay, good. We're let's good. let's get started. Yep. Uh, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's I think the seventh of September, twenty eleven, and we have a couple of people, or a couple of groups of people here. Uh, we're still learning more from Monica Hardy. Thank you, Monica, <laughs> for talking about the mindset of the Innovation Lab in. Loveland, Colorado. Did I get it right that thing? Yes. I think it. <laughs> yes, you did. That's great. Welcome. Why don't you start by introducing, saying what's on your mind, and then we'll introduce the Pericles group. Thank you for being so game here, everybody. Uh, we have maybe two different kinds of groups here, and uh, I did say to Monica briefly, and we can maybe say this more directly, that this is about us learning. Uh, we're, we're taking advantage, trying to learn about what's going on with the Pericles group, and then also continuing to learn from Monica and her friends, <laughs> if we can say it that way. Um, and so we welcome all of you. I think our goal is to learn about learning, how kids learn, how people learn. Is that a fair introduction? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think especially with conversations we've had this week, um, to listen without an agenda. There's Marianne. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome, Marianne. That's a scary Hi. look. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'd like to hear about the other guys first, Paul. Is you that, do that bad? No, that's cool. But say a little more about what you mean about listening without an agenda. Um, one of the, we're trying to get what we're, what we've been working on the past two or three years, um, into like an edible piece so other people can, can, can join us if they'd like, or, you know, continue doing their own thing, but know that one of our main missions is to come up with, um, a means to show that there's an alternative way to learn and it's just focusing on the process of learning. And we're doing um, documenting that so that we can say, you know, to Bill Gates, to Obama, um, this is a more humane way to monitor growth. Um, number one, because it's about something that's not going to change. It's the process of learning. And number two, because it's, it's a comparison to yourself. And so it's more of a personal best as opposed to comparing yourself to someone else or to another nation. Um, so one of the main, there's five different, we're writing a book, there's five different chapters, a very short book. Um, and one of them is about mentoring alongside, which Amy on the far left has been my mentor. She's an unschooling mom, and I've learned a lot from her, got to see her model this. And one of the key elements of that is to listen without an agenda. And I think that's one of the hardest things for us to get, um, because we think we're, we think we're offering new things, and we think we're offering kids to have their choice, but it's still within a box. Um, we still have that agenda. And even if it's just in our expression, because we're so used to it, you know. Um, so anyway, listening without an agenda is, is huge, and it's, it's, a daily, it's a daily struggle to, to do that, but the benefits are um, incredible. So. Cool. So I'll go ahead and introduce the guys who are with me, but then I really would like to hear um, that from good. the other guys. On the very far left, and my screen's over, I think Amy is still on the very far left, <laughs> is Amy. Hi, Chris. And, um, Amy, do you want to say a couple words? Um, sure. I, uh, I'll just introduce myself again. I um, am Amy Lurk. I uh, have an undergraduate degree in psychology and a um, graduate degree in molecular biology and neurobiology, and um, I am unschooling my kids and uh, have been enjoying participating in the uh, growth of the Innovation Lab in Loveland, Colorado. Cool. Thank you. She, like I say, she's been just, um, an inc her family has been an incredible learning experience for me. And then and next in there is wanna... Chris Sloan and then Jodvar. Go ahead. Okay, then Joe Beer, Joe Beer. and um, I'll let him go ahead. It's Joe, and it's Beer, with a D in the middle, Joe Beer. Um, I'll let him go and talk first, and then I'll add if he, if he didn't get enough of it in there. Yeah. 
I hope they'll come back. I'm back. Hello? Let's just give it a second and I want to get back in here again. It doesn't happen very that often. That was fun. All hanging out happened. together. Right. <laughs> Never done that before. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do My link broke. They uh, we all did for all of us. So go we ahead. We all left, Joe Beer. Joe Beer, go ahead. Um, so, Introduce yourself a little bit. Um, I pronounce my name as Jod Beer, so that's easy just to let you know, guys. Um, I'm com I come from India. I did my Bachelor's of Engineering there and then came to the United States for better education. And then I, then I, then I found uh, the similarities, the differences in education. And the second year of my Master's, I got into um, the education, um, how the whole history and the meaning and the purpose of it. And then I started reading more about it along with my engineering background. And then I got in touch with Monica and we started sharing stuff online and I started following her innovation lab at Thompson Valley School. And uh, uh, from the last one and a half years, I've been reading a lot about education in the US and in the India and overall its purpose and its, its what is the fundamental reason behind it. Work. And, and from the last 10 days, uh, from the last three or four days, I've got this opportunity to come here and actually be part of the innovation lab and come here and see how things are going here, even though I know most of the stuff. So it's been really great experience from the last three days, I would say, uh, talking to different people and these kids. And um, I mean, the whole energy itself in this house, it's called the B house, BU house, it's, it's incredible, I would say. And we, we need more spaces like this. And maybe virtually we are definitely talking, but we need some of the physical space where we can visualize for even for people who cannot visualize at this moment. So yeah, it's been incredible. Cool. Yeah. Um, like I said before, just the whole concept of we, we came together because we were passionate about the same thing and now we're meeting face to face. And then the house being a physical manifestation of the web. I mean, that's really what we're trying to model in the house and, um, We'll share some things that, since just since Joe Beer has been here, um, you just you get to amp things up when you already had that background, and so some incredible things just in the short time he's been here that was, has transformed the house. So, and Mar Marianne, maybe introduce yourself, and then we'll get to the Pericles group. Marianne, can you hear? Marianne? We can't hear her. Okay. That's all right. I need to turn this way. <laughs> well, until That's she fine. comes on, Marianne is in New Jersey, and she has um, written, I asked her to write a chapter for the book on rhizomes, and what she wrote was so resonating that now it's like the prologue of the book, and it permeates each of the chapters. And um, if you if you don't know her, you should follow her, her uh, writing and her photography and her artwork. She just knows how to capture thoughts and um, just incredible. I think, um, can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Welcome. You, you know what? Um, I'm embarrassed to tell you I had muted the mic. <laughs> so nah. I unmuted don't be embarrassed. It. We all it do that. It seems to be working. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even know I could do that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Marianne. Um, I'm here in New Jersey. I've um, been in education for the last um, 25, 26 years. Um, I'm a, a teacher, an administrator. Um, I've worked in uh, very large school systems. I used to be the director of literacy for Newark Public Schools, and, and now I'm a, a director of curriculum for uh, a school district in, in New Jersey, Morristown. I'm interested in lots of um, alternatives to, to what we do traditionally and um, got connected with Monica and some other people um, really through Twitter and it's just been very eye-opening um, to you know just to really begin to explore what are some ways that um, we can disrupt the kind of current education um, based on standard education. I don't think that's me. I think it's Adam. I'm not sure. It's okay. 
anyway, that's it. Um, glad to be here and glad to be with you. Welcome. Yeah, let's see if we can figure out where that sound is coming from. I think it's Adam. How do we mute somebody? Oh, we just go here and go. Okay. It's not here. Oh, it went away. Who, who was it? Who was it? What was it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Okay, so uh, guys, thank you for um, being patient here. Teachers teaching teachers, you guys may not know much about us. We've been doing this kind of thing for about six years on Skype, and um, we're kind of making a transition to Hangouts and trying to figure things out. And at this point, it's a little hard to see who's a regular guest and who's a host and who's who's what. So welcome <laughs> to Hangout. Hangout's almost an appropriate word here, I think. Um, but we want to learn about you guys. Fascinated by the card games you were cre creating. Fascinated. I got to say, I'm fascinated by classics teachers dealing with gaming. And so I wanted to kind of, <laughs> you know, Kev, should can I we start, start there? Uh, <laughs> introduce yourselves a little yeah. bit. Uh, Kevin, do you want to start or doesn't matter where you start? But go ahead. Actually, if we're going to, if we lead with the uh, classics teachers uh, gaming, <laughs> Roger's the best place to start us off. Okay, Roger, okay. introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm Roger Travis, uh, and I'm actually a PhD in comparative literature, um, but I teach classics at the University of Connecticut, and both Kevin and Stephen are former students of mine in that capacity. Um, Kevin was, in fact, a classics major and then went on to grad school in Colorado um, in classics and came back and is now teaching a classics in Connecticut. Um, Steve went on to genetic engineering uh, and then found his way back to the classroom and is now at UConn as a grad student in educational psychology. Um, and uh, the classics and gaming thing comes from this very strange connection that I started exploring around 2004 between ancient epic, that is the Iliad and the Odyssey, and what kids and everybody else, since the average age of the gamer is skyrocketing these days, thank God, um, <laughs> is doing when they play especially adventure games like uh, World of Warcraft, um, Dragon Age, Knights of the Old Republic. Um, and I found this connection because, as you guys may or may not know, the books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, as we have them, are fossils of this once living epic tradition. And in this living epic tradition, the bard would recompose a new version of the Iliad and the Odyssey every night. Um, and that's exactly what gamers are doing when they are playing Halo or World of Warcraft. They are composing their own version of the story. And there are all sorts of other amazing connections to make from the content in which in the Iliad, if you know the Iliad at all, the main uh, the, the largest mass of the Iliad is heroes killing each other repetitively, the same way that the player of Halo kills aliens repetitively, or the player of World of Warcraft kills monster after monster after monster. Um, from there to the fact that games recently have been doing a lot of ethical reflection, the same way that the Iliad and the Odyssey do ethical reflection, and even more importantly, to education, because Homer was the curriculum in ancient Athens, the cradle of democracy, the cradle of civilization, whatever you want to call it. Homer was the curriculum, and Plato was unhappy about it. So the reason Plato writes the Republic in large part is because he wants to reform education. He wants to make sure that these epics that the Athenian kids are learning from are not the main part of the curriculum. And he comes up with this thing, the cave, as a way of describing it. When you really look at the cave in the context of Athenian culture, the prisoners who are watching the shadow puppet play, which is all they know of the world, they're being educated in the traditional Athenian way. They are learning their Homer, and their assessments are this strange game. And I, I like to say that the cave is the very first video game because there's this game that they play and they give each other prizes for who can figure out which shadow is going to come across the wall next. Hmm. And when the guy who's been up to the light comes back down and tries to convince everybody to get up, 
the first thing he does is to play their game, and he gets owned because his eyes haven't adjusted back to the dark yet. And when he finally says, your game is stupid, everybody kills him because they want to keep playing their game, which is exactly what happens when we try to reform education the way Plato tried to reform education. And so what we see is that there is this fundamental connection between games and learning that we lost a long time ago. And so out of classics, out of this thing that happened 2,500 years ago, comes the, the idea that we've been exploring, which is that if you put the ludic element, if you put the play, and ludus is the word for school in Latin, as it is the word for game and the word for play. If you put the ludic element back into learning, you can, in fact, use the rules of games to foster the learning the same way that happened in Homer and the same way that happened in Plato when Plato decided he was going to kind of break the cycle and come up with his new way of doing education. What he came up with was Roger. the incredibly oh. playful <laughs> form of the Platonic dialogue. So that's, I, um, I, when, no, when I start, I, it's hard for me to stop, but I will stop there. <laughs> I notice. No, no, but I feel like I'm being schooled and it's just like flying by kind of fast and a little dialogue is what we need, I think. Uh, we've been joined by Adam. And Adam, did he turn the stream off? I hope he did. It looks like he did. Yep. Okay. Anyway. Go ahead. J uh, who would like to jump in with what they just heard from Roger there? <laughs> um, or kind of break it down for us a little more, maybe? Well, why, Kevin, why don't you talk about Lapis and go, and go nuts and bolts? Okay, so uh, kind good. of the nuts and bolts of that uh, on the ground level is what we did is trying to take the best elements of games. And there's one thing that games do really well, it's teach you how to play the game. And so we figured if we could take those best elements about how to teach you how to play the game and make the game be education, be learning Latin, by playing the game, our students are learning Latin. And, you know, that's probably about as... Uh, Okay, so the, the victory condition down. of the game is read an inscription. The victory condition of the course is read an inscription. So there's this one-to-one -one mapping, and in order to do that, we put them through an, a role-playing game in which they get to play as young Romans who are trying to kind of make their way in the world. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you want to talk about cards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, explain the cards a little bit. Okay, um, so the cards were uh, basically born out of uh, a mechanic in the Latin course, and what we did was take the idea, uh, how many people here are familiar with the idea of Pokemon? Of what? <laughs> Pokemon. Pokemon. Oh, Pokemon, yes, yeah. sure. Oh, okay, so the, the, the catchphrase for uh, Pokemon is gotta catch them all, you gotta collect all of the Pokemon uh, in order to complete your collection and battle and do all of that stuff. Well, we said, can we take that and apply it to Latin grammatical forms? Can we say, okay, you've got to collect all of the imperfect verbs. You've got to collect all of the subject nouns, all of the uh, direct object nouns. And can we turn that into a game mechanic that makes it a little bit more engaging <laughs> than just saying, okay, learn a mo, a mas, a mat, mamas, mat, mat, right? And the and Kevin, cards could, originally started out as Kevin, a reward. Yes. Yeah. yeah, maybe you're about to explain it, but let me ask. Um, in the in the gaming work that I've done, that I've done, that that whole notion of a gaming mechanic is a really really mm -hmm. important notion. It's what kind of distinguishes gaming from other things, I think. But could you kind of define what you mean by that? What is a mechanic? Uh. The, in, the, in terms of a course, yeah. a mechanic ends up just being an activity. It's, it's something you, you do that, um, that furthers your progress towards a learning objective. In terms of a game, a mechanic is a bundle of rules that controls the relationship between player input and game state. Um, 
so that uh, when you when you see instructional design and game design as, as kind of flip sides of the same coin, the way we've started to do, um, any activity that furthers your progress ends up being a mechanic when you're designing the course as a game. So the collection mechanic in Operation Lapis is um, by inputting your collection of, say, imperfect verbs. Let's say if you collect 20 imperfect verbs, you get the card of Mark Antony. Um, uh, you, um, your player input is those 20 forms, and the game state is you now have that card. And when you start seeing courses in terms of game design this way, um, student-centered learning becomes completely natural. Um, it's, it's, a it's a question of, of how, how the student wants, wants to make, to make progress, progress rather than how the teacher is going to tell the student what the student needs, needs quote unquote, to know. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I just want to identify the music in the background. Monica, is that something going on downstairs? Or is that yeah, another place? Uh -huh. Yes, there's, there's a group that meets Wednesday nights here, so. Okay. Yeah, that's singing going on downstairs. Live singing. We're a community cool. center. We're, we're using no, the I, house nonstop. I just wanted to identify it. It sounds cool. Yes. Do you want to introduce Adam as we go here? And then I want to get back to the student-centered learning that was just mentioned. Adam, welcome. Sure. Hi. I thought, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Sounds good. Okay, good. cool. Yeah. And live stream is off. Everything's good now. <laughs> Welcome. Great. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a CSU. I go to Colorado State University. I'm student teaching this semester and working with Monica in the lab and um, been going through the detox process myself and really having a great experience with it. So I think that's all I'll say so we can get back to the topic tonight. All right, as long as you promised. To, to explain more in a second. I will. Oh, definitely. I just want, yeah, I can say more. I can certainly talk about myself. But. <laughs> so some of the comments in the chat, uh, the live chat, um, Kevin, and I wanted to address this to you, were, was that this game sounds like fun. Do your students experience it as fun? <laughs> Um, I Can try I to that? dissuade them as, as, as thinking it is fun. Uh, no, I'm Why kidding. Is that? <laughs> um, we certainly, oh, well, fun, fun, fun is a term that I think gets thrown around too uh, kind of haphazardly in education right now. There's a lot of stuff where people are saying, oh, we need to make this fun. We need to make this fun first. And, mm -hmm. you know, instead we like to use terms like engaging or immersive rather than fun. Um, because of the kind of weight that fun has, both negative and positive. I, I tend to tell my students that my methods put them in serious danger of having a three-letter word that starts with F. Um, and if they have that thing, it's not my fault. Um, and the, the, the problem is that um, students, I, I, I do find that students can react negatively to the idea that, that they should be having fun. I mean, it's, it's as if they're, they're looking for the catch. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're looking for the, the way uh, the broccoli is going to be right there under the chocolate. Mm -hmm. Hey, Marianne, do you want to address that with your son? Um, in what way? Um, well, I'm thinking specifically in regard to him playing Minecraft and feeling mm -hmm. like it's not learning. Oh, right, right. I, yeah, I wasn't following what, what exactly you meant. No, it's just a comment that um, I have a 12-year-old son, and he is an avid Minecraft player. And, um, yeah. you know, one of his comments, I mean, there's tremendous amounts of learning that, that are going on um, as he's playing. But um, his comment to me was that, I, you know, I mentioned something about learning, and he said to me, no, 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 this isn't learning, because he still has the, the connotation that learning is what happens in school, mm -hmm. and school learning doesn't tend to have um, a three-letter word that begins with F um, in it. Um, it doesn't, and, and it's not immersive, unfortunately, right now for him, or, um, you know, empowering. So, um, you know, I'm kind of thrilled to hear that um, at, a, at a college level, um, 
you know, that games are a serious way, serious in the sense of we take them seriously, that it's a, it's a method that, um, you know, I, I think just makes great sense. Also, if I, I just wanted to add one other part. We actually began in the high school where, where um, I do some work now, we began a Classics Academy um, a year ago. We're in our second year of it. Um, after this, Paul, I'm not sure where to send this, but I, I, if, if you give me a place to send it, I'll put up a link. A filmmaker, a documentary was made, it's about 15 minutes, and what uh, of, of the Classics Academy, and um, a good portion of it um, uh, features senior students' exhibitions. And students had to um, answer a question about how the past and forms are present. And I, I think since the Iliad was mentioned, I, I, I think you, you'll all find it quite um, relevant to this conversation. It's really very interesting to see the way um, nine students really created very, very different responses. And they were all public exhibitions. Um, so I, I won't say more about it, just that um, at some point, I, I know, I think you had said it was at, at your Connecticut University. It's at University of Connecticut, but University. Kevin is at um, Norwich Free Academy, which is a high school in Norwich, Connecticut, and we've got Lapis running. How many high schools do we have now? Kevin? Um, I think, I'm trying to count, 10 or 11 high schools in six or seven different states now. We have an incredible Latin program where I am. And um, we'll be starting an ancient Greek um, right. course as well. Um, it, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of kids involved in our Latin program, largely because of our, uh, not large, because of our Latin teachers. And um, one of them is actually involved with me in the alternative to high school project we're planning. But I'd love just to connect you. I, I won't take more time because I'm sure there's other people who want to speak about this. But, you know, just a lot of what I'm hearing. I think um, our Latin teachers would really find quite interesting. Great, great. Thanks, Marianne. I had a question for you, too. Um, we have a Latin program at our school, and so um, they're, you know, they might be interested in, in joining. Um, and then, you know, my students read the Odyssey and Beowulf, and, you know, we're into the epic tradition as well. So, like, if another class wanted to um, connect with your class through this, uh, through your, I forget the name of the site. The right, um, com is the basic site. We, we have several different kind of uh, operations going. We call courses operations, more or less. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we'd love to, um, to get people talking about this, um, whoever we can. Is it set up for like uh, you know inviting students into the we have game a demo. from the outside? We we have a demo, but there are, I, I think we could probably work out something that that was a little more um, integral in in terms of showing um, people how the the actual mechanics work um, and what what the different things we're looking at are. I mean, there's Operation Lapis, which is the now two year introductory Latin curriculum, but then the things that I'm doing, I have a course that uh, involves going into the Lord of the Rings online to learn how to be a modern bard um, because of the connection between the Homeric epics and the, uh, um, and the massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Um, last spring, I ran a course um, uh, infiltrating the academy and trying to figure out um, who was right, Plato or Aristotle. Of course, neither of them and both of them. But um, <laughs> what I'm doing now is Herodotus and Thucydides trying to tell Athens what's going to happen in the Peloponnesian War and how Pericles should be uh, resolving his conflict. So, I mean, there are different things going on all the time, and we'd love to talk to as many people as we can about um, how it all works. So I guess if I could ask Chris's question again, I'm wondering... So if Chris wants to join and start doing this, does he get cards somewhere or go to a website? What's like? What's the next step? <laughs> okay. But I think Card Tommen is a great place to start. Kev, go. Yeah, I mean, Card Tommen is a standalone um, game. It can act both integrated with Operation Lapis or by itself, and really, it's extended beyond not Latin, but rather all of Roman history and culture. And it's more of a discussion debate game. Uh, the mechanics lend the students to uh, have cards in their hand 
And if they don't know about the cards in their hand, they're not going to be able to argue and debate about them very well. And so our ideas are that they'll go online or, or whatever other resources to learn more about the cards in their collection to then, in subsequent games, uh, be able to argue their points a whole lot better. Um, the general premise is uh, they basically have two minutes um, to argue why their card that they've chosen um, meets the criteria of one of uh, 20 controversies, as we call them, uh, decided by a 20-sided die roll. And so it's so, kind of apples for apples. Apples for apples, exactly. And, uh, you know, the controversies... Can you give us an example? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. They range from uh, more significant uh, to world history, greatest contribution to literature, uh, favored more by, say, the optimates, or favored more by the populares, two important political factions in Rome. Uh, and so they have to know really uh, quite a lot um, about their particular card in order to argue it in front of the judge, the uh, third party there who decides the ultimate winner. So do you have a card in front of you? Could you read one to us? That's kind um, of an example I'm looking for. <laughs> yes. Uh, give me one second here. I'm yeah, okay. move my uh, video. Uh, Stephen, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, I can uh, Tell us talk how a little you're bit. I, here. I haven't had a chance to interject yet, um, Go mostly ahead. because my background in all of this is as an educational psychologist. So, mm -hmm. um, as Roger said, I, I previously was a genetic engineer and went back and became a teacher, and since then have gone back to school and am working on my PhD in ed psych. Um, so, what I've been doing with Roger, the way I got involved with this is when I was teaching biology at the high school level, I was sort of integrating my games in my own way. I use the game Spore to help sort of scaffold natural selection and evolution and talk about the similarities and differences between the two. And I had also begun to create a forum-based website where students were going through sort of an ARG or an alternate reality game where they were solving problems as scientists. And so my interest in this you is more from a STEM yourself? angle. Yeah, that, at the time, this is prior to me going back to school. Yep. It, it was uh, actually what got me talking to Roger again. And as Roger said, he was a, previously a professor that I had had as a student. So my interest became doing the same kind of thing that we're doing with Practimime, but doing it with the sciences, which are a huge uh, shortage area right now. So kind of what we've done and applied to Operation Lapis, I've started to do with something called Operation Biome, which is a life science version of the same thing, this role-playing game in which students are problem-solving, and each prompt that they get is something similar to what they would do if they were a real-world scientist. And it all comes down to what we talk about, I'm sure most of you have heard of something called situated learning or immersive learning, and this idea that if you want students to critically think or do things that are reflective of what they would do in a career, you have to give them the opportunity to do those things in reality. You can't just teach them, you know, we're going to teach critical thinking skills for two weeks and we're going to teach observation for two weeks. You have to actually give them problems to solve and have them work together uh, um, socially. Kevin, do you have that example ready? Thanks. Yes, I do. Okay. And so I hope that this Jump comes in. across okay on, uh, on the screen. It can. Uh, but here it, you are. Yeah. A typical card. Uh, can, this is, uh, can you explain here. like how you get these cards produced and like how like it's pretty cool. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we, uh, in our in our little collective here, Steve is actually a, a, a budgeting artist as well, and he did a lot of the artwork for the cards. Uh, my wife is is a very talented graphic designer, and so she did all of the layout of you know the actual cards themselves. And there's a company. Uh, in Madison, Wisconsin called the Game Crafter, and uh, they specialize in short-run uh, kind of custom projects, and uh -huh. uh, we were able to produce these cards uh, through them, and frankly, if they weren't in existence, I'm not entirely sure that we would be able to produce these cards, um, because traditional publishers require you to order 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 copies of a game before they'll even think about producing it. And that's Game Crafter? Is that what you said? Yep, the Game Crafter, yeah, Cool. All right. So hold that card up again and tell us what's on it. <laughs> Sorry to keep interrupting you. Okay. You <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I'm trying to combat the lag here. Okay. Uh, so we've got some artwork at the top. It looks like a, a fairly common uh, 
trading card game card. Um, there's a little bit of information blurb in the box, just enough to kind of whet their appetite and make them realize that, well, if they try to just read the card and defend their point, they're not going to get anywhere. Um, and then, you know, we have our, you know, logo on the back and that kind of stuff as well. So, so the idea is that the, the beginning of what they want to learn is on the card, but that that's going to necessarily lead them on because if they have to make an argument for two minutes, they're going to they're going to need more information, um, and so it's it's a process that's completely student centered because they're responsible. They have to take responsibility if they want to succeed in the game for building their knowledge of Augustus or the Colosseum, aka the Flavian Amphitheater, um, the Arch of Titus. Uh, the seven wonders of the world are all a part of, of this first deck, and um, all of the controversies are designed so that an argument can be made for any card. So, greater influence on literature, if you, um, you can actually use the Colosseum for that, because if you know enough about the Colosseum, you know that it figured greatly in a lot of uh, the, the Roman writers' writings about the period. Um, so, it, it becomes a learning experience that, um, that focuses completely on their own movement towards the objectives. So I'm guessing that uh, some kids then in, in your class just go crazy for this idea, right? Absolutely. Like some of them like want to get to the whatever the end result is or they want to keep going and find out more. So do those kids, and this kind of speaks to Monica's work too, I think, do those kids who I'm imagining, you know, maybe aren't always the most successful in all the academic classes, like, do they take on roles of, like, mentors and teachers for the others? Yeah, that modeling happens uh, amazingly well, especially in the courses as we've designed them, where other students will see um, the students that really are getting it and kind of really going above and beyond. And they'll learn uh, from the models that they put forth. You know, Roger, I think you see that a lot in your college classes as well, with kind of your high-powered operatives really paving the way. And throughout the course of the year, the other ones uh, tend to kind of elevate their game, so to speak, um, much more than I think they would otherwise. They role play in teams, in fact, and they have to collaborate on, uh, they take turns being what we call the lead operative, and the lead operative is responsible for figuring out what their character is going to do, but they all have a, a share in that, um, and that is absolutely crucial. It, it's what I think of as kind of breaking the chains of the prisoners in the cave, um, because they're, they're able to see the process of learning that they're, they're going through, um, rather than just be so completely taken up in the process, as, as I think happens with what's usually called gamification, the badges and the points, where it's just kind of a self-reinforcing thing that's intended to provide motivation, but eventually kind of offers diminishing returns. When you have the chance to break that system and look at the learning process, um, I think the, the student um, gets a motivation that, that's uh, almost entirely intrinsic. Oh. That's real. <laughs> uh, seems like someone wants to speak. <laughs> Sounds like it. That wasn't Folks. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amy or uh, is it John Beer or, or Adam or anybody? Um, do you guys have any questions, thoughts? for um, the Pericles group? I have a question. I have, uh, um, so this is still, I'm still in the early phases of Adam. the simulation. Yeah, this is Adam again, and again, I'm a Colorado State University student. My content area is English. I didn't mention that. So the literature and the stuff you're doing is really, really interesting to me. I, I would like to see that, I'd like to see your curriculum in writing somewhere. I don't know if you have you know, that available for others to look at, but that would be really interesting to me. But I started, this, the project's kind of on pause, but um, I started building the simulation for Sherman Alexie's book, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Wow. And I basically am trying to develop um, a pre-reading, a during-reading, and an after-reading strategy. And, you know, the Iliad was mentioned earlier, too, and I really like the idea of sort of the hero's journey. And it kind of sounds like that's part of what's, 
happening with with those cards. The student kind of takes on the role of, of a hero, and they, they embody this character. And I kind of came in late in the conversation, so I missed some of what was said before, and I apologize for that. Um, but I guess that would be my question, sort of, um, you know, the trajectory and sort of what is the, the final assessment of... Of, I mean, do they do presentations? Do they present what they've learned based upon the cards and the people they embody? Because that's sort of what I envisioned with with doing the simulation is that they, you know, this experience, this Native American experience of going into a white school and sort of what, you know, that's like. And this was spawned from this, um, this article that was published in Teacher's Magazine, actually, in 1990. It's called An Indian's Father's Plea. And it, it's basically an Indian father pleading to teachers to be sensitive to the cultural traditions of, you know, the tribe that they're from. And that's sort of what spawned this idea. And I'm really interested in Sherman Alexi, so I wanted to, you know, develop a simulation to teach this book. But I think those cards could be even incorporated in a way. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really interested in that. And so, I don't know, what would, I, I, I guess... That's well, all, let's, that's, let's talk about the final assessment of yeah, that's uh, good operation. Question. That's a good question. Yeah, well, the, the final assessment of the first year of Operation Lapis um, is to basically do, deliver an oration um, ab about what each team's character uh, thinks about um, how, uh, how Rome has developed. Because the story as it stands is about um, these young people trying to figure out um, how to find this inscription, and it's going to turn out that the inscription is absolutely essential to the identity of what it means to be Roman. And so they're kind of gradually moving towards that identity. And so the assessments, um, it's, the, it's what we call it is a continuous embedded formative assessment, um, meaning that uh, at every moment um, as they're collaborating, we're able to see exactly how far they've gotten towards the learning objectives and then when they kind of finally stand and deliver it it looks like a summative assessment I mean it, it looks kind of like an exam essay um, but it also functions as this amazing culmination of this continuous formative assessment and we, um, I think we could use the cards I mean that would that's actually pretty awesome we didn't hadn't thought of that because we didn't have the cards in um, in this form when we were uh, doing the first year Kev what do you think uh, no, absolutely. And you already hit that. I was going to jump in on the, the continuous formative assessment. Um, each night, basically, they're collaborating inside of um, an internet forum uh, and discussing with their team. And, and Roger absolutely nailed it that every step of the way, I can see exactly where my students are at, both in their ability to read Latin and their ability to understand the culture and, and uh, understand just uh, its significance in, in their current episode. One other thing that we haven't touched upon uh, here tonight uh, is the idea of narrative and how powerful that is to the course. Uh, the narrative is continuous and the narrative starts uh, in the first week of school and goes all the way to the end. And it's not something that we do on Fridays, it's not something that we go you know, every other week to the lab to do, but rather it is the course, the game is the course, and the course is the game. Um, and so they're always involved in that story, telling the story of what it means for their Roman to exist in the Rome that we've created uh, for them to exist in. And I, I think that lends itself to humanities so well. I mean, Steve is, um, Steve thinks it also lends itself to, to life sciences, thank goodness. But it, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious the way it lends itself to, to something like English, Adam, um, that you can uh, recreate in a kind of um, gamerly fashion um, the, uh, the, the book that you're, um, you're trying to bring across to the students and let them actually live it. I mean, the experience of kind of living as a Greek or a Roman um, is something that all of my students, um, even the ones who kind of came into it grudgingly at first, um, say kind of transforms the way they think about the material. Thank you. So I was going to ask a question that maybe draws Amy in or <laughs> Monica again. I did ask how a teacher might what the next steps might be and we could talk about that a little bit more but what if a student developed a passion for latin or for wanting to play these games is there a way for an individual student to join in some way 
At this point, it's tough, um, but we're we're um, moving towards a model where we're kind of running, um, uh, running a site that various people can uh, join in on. We're at this point, we're kind of reliant on still the structure of of classes coming in, because it, the the experience is supposed to be collaborative. But um, if we kind of if we catch on. What we really want to do is have it possible for for students all around the world to come together because it, it's completely asynchronous. They they don't have to be on at the same time, um, and it would be possible to form a, a team of of three or four to go through the narrative. And we we um, really are looking towards doing that in in the next year or so. But at, at this point, it um, we're set up such that we we kind of need the the class structure. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll just jump in uh, just real quick, and that's because uh, there's nothing that's really automated about this. Everything involves uh, having an active guide. We call this guide the Demiurge, uh, the one that's bringing the students through and acting as the liaison from Mission Control, uh, operating their simulation for them. And it requires the teacher to be there or whatever guide figure, the content specialist, uh, to to help them along the way and, and provide feedback that an automated system uh, and just sitting down with somebody with a controller uh, just can't do to achieve all of the learning objectives that we want to achieve. One of the things that's really valuable to note about that is that the content delivery that comes from utilizing, say, a game, um, Grand Theft Auto or, or any other particular game, is really good, as Kevin said earlier, at showing you how to play the game. And the real value of doing what we're doing with Practimine is this idea of meta-reflection. So the, the, when the students are coming to school, the teacher is more of a facilitator role than anything else. The teacher is not a direct instructor who's getting in front in a podium and then talking at the kids. The teacher is serving to help the kids construct their own knowledge of the world around them. And that's really why this is such a valuable process, is if you want to create a situated environment, you have to have students participating in and creating and owning their own learning. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, um, so, so what would a typical, um, I'm, do students actually meet with you face-to-face -face in, in, in something traditional like a classroom? Or is all of this done individually online where students play the game at whenever time they want to? I, I'm just having trouble um, understanding how that all works. Uh, actually, both. Um, in, in my high school classes, which is a traditional, very traditional high school, uh, we have a hybrid model where we spend a lot of time face-to-face uh, -face contact in class, doing both stuff in the game um, and doing kind of some direct instruction. But most of Roger's classes at the University of Connecticut are 100% online. Mm -hmm. And the experience uh, differs a little bit there as well. Yeah, they're, they're designed um, according to our ID process at, at UConn, which involves um, online asynchronous. Um, and uh, thankfully, we have a great ID department. Um, and they, they really helped me kind of think through the various issues. So I do a lot of soft scaffolding, um, sometimes by video chat. Um, mm -hmm. sometimes just by uh, text message chat um, to make sure that they're they're with the game because it, it, um, you'd be surprised how anxious st students who have gone through their entire lives in a traditional setting are sure. about starting something that where the expectations are much less clear because they have to set their own expectations um, but uh, in any case it's in in my um, to the extent that I have a classroom it's the text on Google Docs um, where one of my mechanics slash activities is collaborative annotation. So that um, when uh, generally on a night when an immersion prompt, as we call them, is due, that is they have to decide what their characters are going to do, um, uh, 10 or 12 out of 20 are going to be on in the same Google Doc, um, shooting comments back and forth. And at the same time, they'll also have an internet forum open. And we call it the Texto-Spatio-Temporal Transmitter. But it's, it's really <laughs> just an internet forum. Um, and uh, they'll have a, a picture of the Acropolis. And then they'll have a text written by me that says, you're on the Acropolis. You see the Parthenon. You see Alcibiades standing there. Um, Alcibiades says, hey, what do you think about what Pericles is up to? 
and based on your reading in Herodotus for the day, you have to go to Alcibiades and, and say, if you're the warrior, you say, well, I want to fight, um, but you say it in a way that shows that you've done the reading. Um, uh, if you're the philosopher, you say, well, I think we should think about it, and you do it in a way that shows you've done the reading. Um, and uh, it all kind of fits together organically, although it takes a few weeks for it to, to get going. Um, and the students have exactly your same question, which is, um, where the heck are we? And uh, eventually, you get them to the point where they think, OK, we're in Greece uh, in 431 BCE. And, and when we can imagine that, everything kind of falls into place. Thank you. No problem. I have a question. Um, you said it is a team game, that, and if a team wins, then you know that these students have performed well. Right. So my question is, um, at an individual level, how do you measure or how do you know that this student or this person has actually learned the um, actual stuff? Because in some teams, you may have students who are not that interested, but they have this class just because of the sake of something. For just an example, and how will we know overall that at an individual level that he has or she has actually learned something? Um, do you have that any measurements? That's a great question. Um, and basically, here's, here's the short answer. Um, the final product of the team uh, isn't factored at all in their grade. What is factored in is the individual contributions by each team measure. And we measure those contributions in uh, an experience point system, which we call Latinity points, or uh, I forget what you're using over the three. Hellism points. Hellism points. Um, that that uh, measures their participation, their contributions to the team. And because it's an internet forum or a Google Doc or any other uh, different sources that we're using, there's a permanent record of what each member has contributed to the discussion. And so it's really easy to go back and say, ah, okay, let's evaluate what Johnny's responses are and then provide really good feedback to Johnny about where he you know, was doing well or where he could have stepped it up a little bit. I, I understand this to be quite a complex system because is, do you have an a, a algorithm, something that says that we have these parameters? Is it a, a manual process in which the performance is measured? It's it's uh, manual. Yeah. And, and so, we can... Go ahead, Judge. Uh, so who is the person who will go through the, all the Google documents and all other stuff to find out? Is it a, a panel of people, or is it just one individual or the teacher itself? The instructor for the course. So, so uh, for my sections at NFA, you know, I will be the one that's evaluating my students. And we actually do have a rubric for the lapis responses to kind of use as a guide for awarding attendee points. But at another high school, it's the, the facilitator in charge of their classes. And they're the ones evaluating their students, et cetera. In, in so our ideal world, when, when this becomes the norm for every Latin class in, in the country, um, <laughs> we, we would uh, establish things like panels which would have specific rubrics, and then um, it would be the easiest thing in the world to code for um, what their responses were showing according to that rubric, and then that coding would follow in the metadata on what we call the operatives dossiers, um, because there's a, a, a document, a Google document, that's shared between the instructor and the student uh, in which um, the instructor communicates all the feedback. Um, and at this point, because there's no place for that metadata to go, um, we're still uh, in a very primitive mode. We're just using the points. Um, but we're working on the rubrics um, with the coding that, that's uh, going to kind of bring everything into much clearer focus. Because we can get uh, as granular as you could ever want. I mean, it, it's as if you're taking the portfolio concept and turning it into a, a kind of gushing feed um, that uh, eventually is going to be able to be readable and scrapable um, very, very easily as long as you establish the coding. So in that case, when you say it is a manual process mm -hmm. and a teacher will have to evaluate among of all of these students in a class, is this too much work? How, how is the response from them? Is it too much work for them or is they, they love it too? It, it's, I'd say it's a different kind of work and I think it's a better kind of work. Um, I probably don't spend any more time 
uh, evaluating the responses in a lapis section than I would grading, uh, you know, rote vocabulary quizzes or translation exams or other stuff I'd be grading in a normal Latin class. And for me, it provides much better uh, analysis of exactly where each student is at. And so I would take uh, doing the hour of evaluating TSTT responses over an hour of grading vocabulary quizzes any day. Thanks. I have a couple of questions. I think they're related. Um, one is, Kevin, I assume you haven't always talked this way. Um, so did uh, going through the experience with Roger, is that what helped you become a teacher like this? Uh, and no, kind of related, Roger, if I could ask one second, oh, okay. is, okay. is like, how did you get permission to mess with something like Latin? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> first, uh, I was Roger's students before Roger was doing any of this cool stuff. He was a typical okay. boring class. <laughs> <laughs> that at one point, he put a paper bag on his head with a face drawn on it, and he was an actor on stage. So I didn't get the experience that his students get now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something I remind him of all of the time. Uh, but rather, it's kind of my own love of gaming uh, and the relationship that I developed with Roger over the years that led us to kind of developing uh, this uh, platform as we've conceived it so far. Um, in terms of being getting the permission, I have uh, some pretty amazing uh, administration at my school um, that are really forward thinking and have allowed me to really go off the deep ends uh, with their full blessing and given me the support and the materials uh, to make it happen. Uh, and so in that case, I'm really fortunate to be in that circumstance. And the, the connection between Kevin and me was, was very helpful because the University of Connecticut, as Steve can attest, has a wonderful uh, education program at our NEAG school. And so when, when Kevin was able to go to his administration, and I think he left out the part that I'm crazy, um, and tell them <laughs> that there was this UConn professor, uh, the classicist, um, who, uh, and I've, I've managed to become connected in the classics community, which um, in New England you, you just do by being willing to, to be an officer in various organizations. Um, and so it, um, it, the, it was the connection, I think, between me and Kevin that, um, that helped um, uh, make it something that the administrators at, at his school were, were willing to try. Um, and it, it's been working out beautifully. So I'm looking up at the clock, and it's around 10 o'clock here in the east. Um, we need to start thinking. I'm wondering if uh, we can go around. You can say some last thoughts, but maybe it's last questions or thoughts you have, questions or thoughts. And Adam, could we start with you, just sort of go across alphabetically here, as Google does so well? Sure. Um, I guess my last thought or question would be um, – how could we make this available across the content areas? You know, it seems like it's working really well, you know, with the classics. I mean, I can already see how it would work with reading and writing. You know, I see the direct connection there. Um, but I love it. You know, I'm just in love with what you showed with, with the cards and, you know, even the terminology you're using. You've really developed that, and, and I love that as well. So where can I go for more information? So yeah, Pokemon.com is, is linked in the chat, and um, just okay. get in touch with us on, on Google Plus as well. Um, Great. We, and we're, we're in the stage where we're starting to sign people up to, to help us uh, move things across the content areas. So okay. we'd, we'd love to talk. Great. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank so you. as you're developing, let me follow up on that a little bit, because I did want to know, too. too uh, um, like... You don't want to lose the power of the classics experiment, right? But as you as you broaden out, so can you do both? <laughs> or we we think so. I mean, it, the mm -hmm. the fact that it it had its uh, birth in this idea about Homeric epic and Plato um, means that the classics is the natural fit. But um, we we really want to try because Plato's insight, I I think wasn't just about um, teaching whatever classics would have been for him, um, but, but was about teaching, ab about the, the way that people learn and, and um, how we can get people thinking uh, on that kind of meta-reflective level. Um, so we think it's worth a try. 
a large part of the doing it with the sciences is it comes from Jerome Bruner, who's a sort of an educational theorist. And one of the things he emphasized was the importance of focusing on the, the story of science and the story of mathematics. And that a lot of times that's lost when you do things like standardized testing. And so a big part of developing this as an operation for, say, biology is making sure that you're directing all of those prompts so that there's a one-to-one -one ratio between what your learning objective is and what your game objective is. So if you want to have your students learn about what it's like to be a doctor who cures cancer, you give them a prompt that says cure cancer. And as long as you embed that in a narrative and you can use the narrative to teach all those ancillary things about scientists, about scientist debates, about what's gone on in scientific history, you can actually hit on a lot more content more deeply and so from my perspective as a non-classicist, this is actually incredibly valuable. Um, and it just hasn't been applied that way. And I think part of that is because people are reluctant to spend the time talking about narrative in science or math. Stephen, what are you specifically working on this fall? <laughs> uh, this fall, I, well, I'm still a doctoral student. And so what I'm doing is developing the qualitative methods portion of my dissertation and mm -hmm. um, taking some more classes. but. Uh, aside from working with the IRB and all that um, co-managing with Roger and Kevin, my job is partly as an art developer for what we're doing, so developing the artwork, and partially to be developing more content for Operation Biome, which is the science practicum. Amy, you've been listening alongside there. Do you have any Amy's, Amy's muted, Tom. Oh, she, she's muted still? She had still? to mute herself. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Chris, let's go to you. Any last thoughts? Yeah, um, when everybody's talking about the classics, I think that, and we've touched on it a little bit, but just the timelessness of the classics is, is a really important point that the reason they're classics in my mind is that we can reread them and they are still relevant to our situation today. So, I mean, you can talk about all kinds of epics, um, but just the Odyssey, I mean, to me, that's relevant today, um, you know, I could go to the land of the Lotus Eaters and, um, you know, I'm, my students find a lot of relevance there. There's a lot of Lotus being eaten around and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, just the way Penelope deals with these guys, you know, she's got to handle this male power system and, and she's figuring out in the best way she can how to do that. And, and the girls in my class can relate to that. So I think the you know, using classics as narratives and, and keeping it relevant is really important to uh, education today. I'm glad you brought all that up because that's I, – I did question that right away, and I got slammed like, of course it's uh, <laughs> relevant to today. So <laughs> well stated. John Beer, any last thoughts? Um, no, I don't have any question, but I did do find it quite interesting, and we'll see what happens next. Cool. Marianne, any last thoughts or questions? Yeah, well, two. One is, first, um, I really appreciate all the comments about narrative. You know, we're at a time politically in our country where, with the Common Core Standards, um, narrative is being devalued. Um, which, I, you know, I think is tragic. So it, it's been lovely to listen to all of you speak. And, um, and and I say even the science, the scientists, not not in a, in a pejorative way, but I mean, I think it's particularly important to understand narrative being, you know, what makes us human. It, it's not it's not minor. Mm. Um, and so that's been really refreshing um, to hear. But the question I had was about the learner and the role of, or, or, or the presence of invention. Is there an opportunity instead of playing, and I understand that inside the game there is obviously invention that goes on, but I meant at a level that is at the gaming level. Is there a way for the learner to you know, sort of hack the game to um, change the game from what your intention is, and and if you could, if so, if you could just speak about that. Um, actually, you went off on a different thing where you're going on the end. Um, I was going to say that last year I had a student who got really uh, into involved with what we were doing, and he started to create his own missions and his own narratives, uh, and he wanted to develop the first set of user-generated content for future 
uh, Latin students uh, to use. Unfortunately, he moved away, uh, but he's been in contact with email and stuff like that. But I, I found that immediately he kind of got drawn in and wanted to create the episodes, the episodic narrative, and design all of the, uh, you know, the characters mm -hmm. and try to match the learning objectives on to what he was creating uh, himself. Uh, in terms of, of hacking and changing the parameters, Roger, I think that happens quite a bit with uh, your college classes, right? Yeah, I mean, w one thing in Lapis is that we have this crazy character who's based a little bit on Agent Smith in The Matrix, um, who, who comes in and challenges the operatives to justify why they're taking a Latin course. Um, uh, and and reappears from from time to time and and tries to scaffold that that kind of level of invention. Um, it's obviously really hard because you have to rely. And Amy's talking about this a little bit in the in the live stream chat as well. You you really want them to generate their own questions, but mm -hmm. how do you make that happen? Um, and what we try to do is is provide as many hooks as we can to show them that if they want to start basically deconstructing their learning experience, they should just go ahead and and the character like Sinistris who's the the crazy character in Lapis is like that in my philosophy course I actually had the machine break down around them um, mm -hmm. to try to get them to, to basically mod the engine and I, I wasn't quite as successful in that as I, I wanted to be and I need to scaffold it better next time to make it clear that I'm, I'm looking for them to invent something um, but just on the level of the annotations that the annotating the text of Herodotus, which is what we're doing in my class uh, right now, um, is about them figuring out what it is in the text that interests them. Mm -hmm. And then I try to turn that around and say, okay, what, how does your character feel about that? Um, how does that strange thing that you just noticed in the text feed back into what's going on for your character? So I, I'm, I try to keep that kind of dialectic going, and it, it's something we, uh, we need to, to work on as we go forward, because I think we all share that aim. Thanks. Well, I'm glad you guys asked this, a lot of the questions I was about to ask. Monica, I want to see if you have any last thoughts or questions. That's you over there in the dark, right? It is Thanks. me, and I do. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I think this is evidence of um, the incredible things that we can do now um, that we haven't been able to do in the past. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, is our focus is that nothing is for everyone. And so um, what we're trying to do is um, create places of permission for people to do what you guys have been talking about this whole time, but also for people that maybe got caught up somehow in your class or, you know, want to do something completely different. Um, one of the things is um, going against the prescribed learning and, you know, who's to say what, what is important to a person now that we can learn whatever we want, whenever we want, um, that should be the choice of the person. And I think that's where the natural intrinsic questioning and drive is going to come from. Um, so I would like to share just a smidge since Joe Beer's here. Um, we were talking the other day about, um, well, Jane McGonigal's reality is broken. There, there's gaming right there. And she talks a lot about making it into real life. And so, um, we were talking about how do you how do you strew things like Amy does with her kids in a natural way, you know that it's it's it, there's exposure there. And so, Joe Beard, do you want to share some about the QR code? Um, yeah, that, that um, it was. I mean, I think it was Amy's idea that just popped out yesterday afternoon, of, and we were just talking about things that how can the things that we have around, how can we um, make people to find out more about them. I had no idea about QR codes before that. So she just said some something about it. Um, Adam talked about it, and then in the morning, I found Monica putting QR codes on the things. And uh, we have some pictures of people and their QR codes that links to their URL uh, website. And and I, there was a gentleman, uh, Paul, he, he had he had iPhone and I told him that he was looking at the wall with these QR codes and the pictures of people. So I told him that he can actually you know link to these things. So when he experienced it was really interesting for him and something that was more of a natural that this Monica was talking about. And 
uh, overall what I, I found out that it was a quite, quite cool idea that just came out out of nowhere among us. And I think I, we're trying to emphasize is let's zoom way out. Let's zoom way out and say, look at all the cool stuff that we can do now. Um, and trying to model a way like the house is completely eclectic, model a way that we can facilitate everything. You know, we've got a web on the wall now that um, will morph daily or weekly with, you know, now there's another note that you've connected to, and now you can look into that more, look into an object more. Um, so, love what you guys are doing. Um, encourage everyone to, to listen with no agenda. Cool. Thanks, Monica. Um, we're going to have to get you a candle or something. I don't know how to <laughs> light things or up. I could, I could raise, maybe we could raise some money for electricity. <laughs> <laughs> or have the show earlier, maybe. <laughs> anyway, maybe by I, next week we'll have it. Next week probably I will be in dark. She's going to be in this room. Yeah, okay. we'll switch rooms. <laughs> I could have joined him, but we probably would have gotten sidetracked. Well, Thanks for the serendipity and, and Pericles group. Thank you guys for all of the great thoughts that, that you Thank have. Thank you for the great questions. Toward. Oh, no, um, thanks for the invitation. I mean, this was fantastic. Yeah, we hope to keep connecting in lots of different ways. Um, we want to say – Is there a uh, way to make sure we connect? Uh, are you on Google Plus? Yes. Uh, feel free to, to add us all on Google+. Plus. There's been some really great conversations. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, especially around about. gamification, which is um, the Jane McGonigal is kind of the flashpoint for right. one of the flashpoints for that. Um, and I, I think those conversations are going to keep going. And, and there are several classicists um, who um, I'll, I'll uh, try to connect you guys to, to who um, are doing amazing things. Thanks. And you'll see everybody here in Google Plus, it'll be listed that you hung out with us. So that's oh, one right. way to, to Perfect. But also, we'll, we'll put this video up at edtechtalk.com and at teachersteachingteachers.org. And I think, Monica, you've been putting it up at Lab Connections as well. Um, and we want to thank Jeff Lebo mm -hmm. and Dave Cormier for orga organizing that community of edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net. So thank you all for hanging out with us, and we're going to say good night. Thank good you. Night. Thanks. Take care. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night.